All right, are we ready for the word now? Where did I say? First Peter. I'm in, why am I First Thessalonians then? First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. I want you to think about these things tonight. This is something we need. The Bible says, for the time has come. Now I want you to pay attention to your Bible. Is, from my English teachers, is right now. Present tense. That means today. Now I believe that there is a time coming where God will refine His church. I believe that. I see it in the scriptures. That's what First Peter is all about. God refining the church. Purifying the church. Taking out the dross. Taking out the chaff. We all know what that is. That's the flesh. That's the stuff that doesn't shine. That's the stuff that doesn't belong in our lives. And I believe in a trial by fire that is coming. But I also believe that those trials take place now. And I also believe that this Bible's right. The time right now to judge the house of God. It is right now time to do that. The house of God is, number one, everybody that's saved all over the world. That's number one. Number two, it is a local body of believers, a local congregation of believers. That is the house of God. That is, I mean, we come into this place and this room, this physical room has been dedicated and set aside for the use of of those who are the house of God. So we call this the house of God. This also must be judged. But then the house of God is I'm looking at them. Each and every one of us is the house of God. Amen. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Father in heaven, help me to preach tonight. I feel like preaching and not just teaching. Because this is a very... Father, this is where your heart is. You, we know that you're going to judge this world. And this world is not going to do well in that judgment. We know that. But Father, it's not right that you judge the world and not judge your own house. A man is supposed to take care of the matters and the affairs of his own house. That's his primary position. And Father, you would not be a just God if you judged the wickedness of this world and did not first judge your own house. So Father, I, your, your word is right. It's correct. The thoughts and the attitude and the philosophy and the doctrine behind this is right and it's proper. And Father, even, even a lost man would agree with this. So Father, I pray, dear God, that you would open up our eyes and help each and every one of us judge our house. Help us, Father, as individuals. Help us, Lord, as a church body. To judge our own church first. Then, judge the rest of the world. And Lord, all of your saints everywhere across the world. What I know about them, Lord, is that they are dedicated to you. They are born again. But Lord, we are 
we fail. We are weak. Our body is weak. Our flesh is weak. Our spirit is strong, but our flesh is weak. And Father, there are things in the body of Jesus Christ, the vine that must be purged. Father, do that first. Then judge the world. Father, teach us, open our eyes, Lord, to our own house tonight. Help us, dear God, as believers in you, to trust you, to follow you, and to believe what you said, and to live by what you said. Bless and honor your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Pay attention to these words. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So, in this one verse, we know God establishes this one truth. God is going to judge this whole world, is he not? God, God is the one who judges everyone who passes before him at the end of their life. And I want to say, I want to say to anybody in this room, and I want to say to anybody listening to me tonight, there will come a time when we all will stand before God to be judged. And you've heard me say this before. There are some say, I don't want church people judging me. I only want God to judge me. Okay. I'm in agreement with that. But understand that what you're saying is, the one who actually has the right to judge you, which is God Almighty, He knows more about you than anybody else, including your own self. God knows more about you than you know about you. And God actually has the book of your deeds, everything that you've done, written down in a book. And God is going to, these things are going to pass before your eyes. No one, no one in this country is ever convicted without being charged first. The charging is the reading off of the offenses. That's the charging part. Nobody ever is judged without being charged first. And you're charged based upon what the law said. Not some arbitrary, well, I make this up as I go law, but as the law, the written laws of God, you will be judged by those laws. But judgment begins at the house of God first. See, God's all about an order of things. He tells us as his believers, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. And so what we have to do in life is we have to learn to get our priorities in line with God's priorities. And I promise you, I've learned this, I've read it in the Bible, and I've learned it to be a fact. God will never take second place in your life. He'll never do it. He's a very jealous God. And if you won't put him first, he will make sure that he's first always. How many of y'all know that? The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if we begin first at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So God's going to judge this world, but God is going to judge the church first. First, before he judges anybody else. Verse 18, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, scarcely, think about what he's saying here. Scarcely be saved. It's because God knows us. And he knows the condition of our heart. He knows the attitude. He knows the sins that God's people commit. And he uses the term scarcely here. And I, I guess I would, I mean, I believe in being saved to the uttermost. Don't get me wrong. But think about the things that God has to deal with in his own people. I mean, how many people are saved in this world right now? I don't know the number. Let's say it's, I don't know, let's say it's five, out of 7 billion people, let's say 100 million people are truly born again. Just, I just grabbed that number out of air. 
A hundred million people right now in this world are born again. And God has to deal with every one of them first. And I believe he will. So if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. There's some of you sitting in this room tonight. You've heard some bad news. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to point fingers, I'm not going to say names, I'm not going to look at anybody, but you've heard bad news. My advice to you, and maybe some of you online, some bad news has come your way this week. So let me encourage you. Them that suffer, commit the keeping of your souls to God. Let God have your soul. Let God have it. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? God's going to force you to trust him. He's going to force you to do it. He's going to make it so that you don't have anything else with which to rely upon. He's going to do that. He's going to make you do it. God made Israel. He forced them to rely upon him. Exodus 14, he takes the Israelites, causes them to turn in their path and go over and park themselves at the coast of the Red Sea. And then he went and hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh got angry, grabbed his chariots. What was it? 600 chariots of iron that he brings. And he's on a path to kill every one of those Jews that he set free. So here we have Pharaoh here, we have the Red Sea here, and we have God's people right here. And he led them into a trap. And he said, I'm going to force you to trust me. And God will lead every one of you into that same trap. If you've been there already, say amen. amen. Guess what? He's got another one waiting for you. Because he's not done causing you to trust him. He's not done. So you are advised tonight with everything that you've heard this week, everything that's come to you this week, you're advised by the word of God, by the Holy Spirit, by your pastor, and by this congregation, you are advised to commit your soul to Jesus Christ because I promise you, he'll keep it better than you ever have. For there's one thing I know about God. I mean, what do we believe about this Bible? We believe that God has preserved every single word and kept it intact for us, correctly translated, so that it's right. Only God can do that. All the mason jars in the world cannot keep the word of God as well as God has kept the word of God. Jesus' body lay in the tomb for two days and God would not allow the body of his Holy One to see any corruption. His body after two days did not smell. Parts of him were not, he was not zombified coming out of that tomb. Eyeball hanging out, right? He was intact. If God can do that, God can keep your soul. Somebody say amen. Let's get back to this idea of judgment beginning at the house of God. I want you to take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. This is all about you first. You first. The liberals in this world want to have a me too movement. Well, I want to have a you first movement. You first. Don't you hate it when you have a boss that makes you do something that he doesn't want to do? Don't you hate that? Shut up, Alicia. You're excluded. A boss tells you to do something, do some icky job, something you, that he doesn't want to do. And you want to say, you first. Am I right? 
Crawl down in this hole and get that out of that hole. You first. Amen? Can I tell you something? Jesus never asks you to do anything that he hasn't already done first. That's why he is the firstborn of many sons. First begotten of the dead, the Bible calls him. He's not asking you, Jesus is not going to ask you to suffer anything that he hasn't already suffered. Am I right on that? He's our example, right? So when it comes to doing what's right, you listen to this, when it comes to doing what's right, it's not right for you to demand that everybody else does right while you do wrong. That's wicked. That's an evil spirit. That ain't right. It ain't fair. And I know people. I've known people all my life. I have been at times that person. And I hate that person. I do. Because I judged everybody around me while I ignored my own transgressions. I did it when I went to Bible college. When I, my first year of Bible college, most everybody hated my guts. They knew about me that I was arrogant, immediately judgmental, and very decisive on how and, and outward with how I felt everybody else had to live in order to satisfy my version of morality. While I myself was violating my own rules. I did it. I hate talking about that. But I used to be despised. My first year of Bible college. To the point that I had a guy that I got onto in front of a group of students. He was one of these young boys that his daddy worked for the college. And his dad said, you go one year to this Christian college and then I'll pay your way to Oklahoma University for the next years that you graduate. And he was lost as a skunk and rotten and filthy and a fornicator. And everybody knew it. And I felt way higher than him. And I called him out one time in front of the student body. And when I walked past him about five minutes later, he grabbed me and put me up against the wall, his hand around my throat like this, with his fist. Maybe I got the wrong hand. Maybe it's like this. And he said, don't you ever talk to me like that again. And all of my quote unquote friends were standing there. And they was going to let him hit me. Because I had it coming. And it took me a while to figure all that out. But by the time I'm in my third year of college, I'm student body chaplain. Now everybody, because my attitude changed. And I started recognizing that I wasn't what I pretended to be. And I wasn't any better than anybody else. And then people started trusting me like a pastor, Amen. student body chaplain. And to say that I was better from then on, that's not true. Because I have my bouts of judgmentalism. You see, I believe this Bible's right. And that makes us vastly different. Than most everybody else in this country who calls himself a Christian. 
Now, I'm not saying we're wrong on this. But what I'm saying is, we have the, the nature and the tendency in us to put everybody who doesn't agree with us on this issue up against the wall with our fist saying to them, you're not as good as I am. That's, that's us. So, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. And see, this Bible is right. And let me tell you something. You don't have to put this Bible in effect in your life. It automatically kicks in gear. Because I was not reading Matthew 7 when that kid took me and put me up against the wall and was going to beat my head in. But you know what? This Bible enacted itself because I had judged him and others. I was up against the wall being judged. Was I not? That was judgment. Took me a while to figure that out. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. Are you catching this? So I'm going to get back to this statement. You first. Whatever judgment you put on any body, be prepared for God to enact that on you first. You see, who's watching everybody? Are there not disagreements between people? Do we not get into it with people? Over things, over issues, over things that we did or they did or things they said or things we said or things they didn't say, we didn't say or what we, whatever. We get into it with people, don't we? And sometimes we get this little Holy Ghost attitude to think that we're right and we say, God, get them. You be very careful. Because the moment, the moment you say that, God will say, okay, you first. And see, you're nodding your heads, you're saying amen. I'm telling you, you don't even have to agree with this. It, God will do this to you. You first, always. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. A while back, I preached a message. I, I think I need to delve into this again and, and get deeper in it about how God hates an unjust balance. You ever read that in the law? I was amazed. Like seven or eight or nine times something like that where God in the scriptures says, I hate an unjust balance or an unjust weight. Because you got people all over the place who love to tip the scales in their favor all the time, don't they? So God saying to the amount that you tip the scales, that's the amount that I'm going to come after you with. This Bible is right, and this Bible doesn't care whether you agree with it or not. It's going to happen that way. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, verse 4, Let me pull the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. I mean, that sounds stupid. Sounds ridiculous, right? You walking around with a two before stuck out of your eye socket. But it's an illustration that gets our attention. Oh, God has sent me to pull the moat out of your eye because you're, you're doing something that ain't right. And you're walking around hitting walls with this big two by four beam sticking out of your skull. I'm not kidding you. I had a man sit in my office who moved his family to this church, who said to me, I'm having a problem, Pastor Mike. What's your problem? I just am finding a hard time trying to tell the people in your church that they're not living right. And I said, who said that that was your job? 
And I said, if it's anybody in this church's job, it would be mine. And I don't go around looking for all the faults in my people. I used to. In my youth, I used to. The older I get, the less judgmental I'm getting. Okay? The saying is right. Grandparents, when it comes to grandparents, you're looking at old people who are trying to get into heaven now. They're not near as mean as they were when they were parents. Am I right, sis? Am I right, sweetie pie? Am I right, Sterling? We're not near as mean as we were when we were parents. We're trying, we're trying to be nice to everybody now. But that man, I was, I was just stunned. But I see, I knew, John, I knew what he was doing. I knew what he was doing. He was spreading rumors and he was going around and gossiping about everybody in this church about how they weren't living right. And it finally came down to where I said, you know what? I don't think you and I should be in the same church together. So he left this. You know what he told me? He said, I just don't understand it. This is the fifth church I've been asked to leave. I'm not making that up. Then he went to another church in this town. Six months later, that pastor called me and he said, do you know so-and-so? And I said, yeah. He said, tell me about him. And I told him, he said, well, I'm going to have to put him out. They were doing the same thing at that church that they were doing here. I don't care if he's listening or not. This Bible is right. And it doesn't have to be enacted by you. It automatically kicks in gear the moment you start breathing air. God's word, God will judge you with the exact same amount of judgment that you've judged everybody else. So maybe you should stop wondering why things are not going well in your life. Verse 5. Who has, let me ask this question. Who in the world has a right to call anybody in this church a hypocrite? God does. And Jesus says it right here. Thou hypocrite. I don't have a right to call anybody in this church a hypocrite. You don't have a right. And I'm going to prove that with scripture. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So what did I just say? You first, right? Look at, look at verse 5. Thou hypocrite, first. You know what that means? You first. Romans chapter 2, turn there. What's Bible? It is right. Now I'm going to repeat something I said here a while back. I don't ever want to hear anybody in my church say, oh, karma's bad. I hate karma. I know what karma is. Karma is the doctrine of reincarnation. Okay? I don't go for that. That's wicked. That's from hell. So I don't want anybody to say it. I'll watch, go home, wash your own mouth out with soap for saying it. Okay? But I will tell you, see, because it, karma is the idea that the universe enacts judgment on everybody. And it's not true. The universe has nothing to do with it. It's God. God is my judge. And God is your judge. And I'm going to be gun barrel straight with you tonight. There's going to come a time when Mike Hoggard is going to stand before a thrice holy God. And I am not looking forward to it. Amen. The mistakes and the failures and the sins that I have committed... There are times when I want to walk out of this church and never return. Because I know what I did. Never come back. I ain't right. Okay? And this side of heaven, I never will be. Therefore, Romans chapter 2 
And I'm saying that to you and for you. Because like me, you also must stand before God. I mean, let's just, let's lay it out like this. Suppose Jesus did come in this room. I would have to sit down. And then Jesus, who knows everybody here, who has the right to cast the stone, right? Remember when they brought the woman caught in adultery? He said, who's without sin? Let him first cast the stone. Well, he was the one qualified for that one. He had never committed any sins. He was qualified. He could have done it. Not even the one who was qualified to do it, did it. But suppose Wayne, suppose John, suppose Mike, suppose Melissa, that Jesus stood in here and he pointed. And he started reading the list of things that you did. He had a right to do it. He has a right to do it. Because there are sins. And oh, would to God that we all had a time machine to go back and shoot ourselves before we did something. So we wouldn't do it. But it's too late. I watched a video the other day of a man at a traffic stop. A woman police officer... And the camera captured all of this. She walked up to the man's car, asked for his driver's license. He reached down and pulled a gun right out at her, aimed it at her like this. She grabbed that gun and was fighting him. And another officer ran up and shot him right in the head. That man, right at that exact point, had to go stand before God and answer for everything that he did. He woke up that day thinking of all the sins that he was going to commit. And he committed every one of them up until that moment that bullet entered his brain. Including he was going to murder an officer. I think God's going to hold him, held him accountable for that one too. And what I'm saying is, every one of us is dirty. Not a one of us is clean. Look at Romans chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man. Inexcusable. Whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. Underline that in your Bible. The next Christian bumper sticker you stick on your car ought to be this verse. For thou that judgest doest the same things. There are people in this world that fornicate. And do nothing but fornicate. Right? And it's wicked and it's wrong. But for us to condemn people who do that, who would want Jesus coming in and exposing our fornications and our adulteries, our lasciviousness. Wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. So God does have the right to judge. It's his law. And he's the only one that didn't break it. So he's the one that gets to judge them. Verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Do you think that you'll escape? Do you think that you'll get by? Do you think that you can commit all your little secret sins while you go and expose everybody else's? I love these clowns on Facebook that think it's their job to call everybody out on everything that they post. That's, that's one reason why you don't see me on Facebook anymore. I used to be on there all the time like everybody else is. And I got sick of it. 
I got sick of the, of the Facebook judges waiting for you to post a picture of a birthday party and some kid there is wearing a t-shirt with some occult thing on it that you know that's, that's a cult and you call them out on that. How come you let that go on in your house? That's the Facebook judges. I'm sick of them. I've, I've had it. We are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Let me, let me remind you of the, the priest, the Levite priest. God did not call the tribe of Levi out to be the priest because they were the holy pious men and all the other tribes were sinners. No, 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 no. Levi himself was a cold-blooded murderer. He's a killer. So God calls the tribe of Levi out not because they're holy pious men, but they're men just like everybody else. And God embeds it into the law. Watch this now. God put it into the law. If I'm a Levite priest, and let's say that, uh, let's say that Mike comes in one day and he's got, he's got a lamb, and he's bringing the lamb to me as a sacrifice for the sins of him and his family. Now I'm the priest. I'm standing there at the gate going, what have you been doing, Mike? What kind of sins you've been doing? Hmm? Hophni and Phineas, as the people would bring in their sacrifices, they'd just steal what they weren't supposed to have. See, God, God provided well for the Levites. They, they, they could live fat and not ever have to farm. As rich as the, everybody else of the tribes of Israel got, that's how rich the Levites got. They always got 10% of everything that came in. And a portion was designated just for them and their living. So some of those guys, I mean, they, they had it well. When everybody else did well, they did well. So here's the Levite priest standing there. You coming in with all your sins. He's sitting there sucking his cigarette and got a little fifth of Jack Daniels down in his boot. And he's wanting to know what all your sins are. But yet God required in the law that before the Levite priest could take your sacrifice, and offer it for your sins. He had to take and offer it for his own sins first. Where does judgment begin? And I had to learn as a pastor that before I start coming down on everybody, about what I think they have to be doing and what I think they need to stop doing and what I think they're guilty of. I have to go to God first and get my own heart cleansed. Then I can preach it to you guys. And I'm not kidding you. Sometimes I don't even want to get up and say a word because I know I've been guilty I don't like it I'm going to stop right here I'll pick this up next Wednesday if, if y'all want more of it do we need more of it so Lindsay this sermon is called you first she always asks me dad what's the sermon called Sometimes I have to think about it. Well, tonight it's you first. And as we pray tonight, I want you to think about it. I want you to think about who you're mad at, who you're upset with, and who you got judgment against. Now, I'm not saying that they're going to get all scot-free. What I'm saying is, you purge your own house first. 
It'd be stupid if you yelled at your neighbor because his trash can tipped over on trash day and some of the garbage was out and you chewed your neighbor out, but your garbage never made it out of the house because it strewed all over the floor. I know people like that. That's sick. See, that'd be stupid, wouldn't it? Why don't you clean that up? You're making the whole place look bad. They can't even get in your house because it's a mess. See, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. You first. You first. 